Okay, I'm going to do a study today on 13 reasons for Christians to reject the Mass. And uh, I want to get a couple things covered here before we get started in this. Uh, first of all, this is not a video for entertainment value. Okay, this is going to be a lot of books, a lot of quotations, a lot of looking things up from first-hand sources over here. These are all Roman Catholic. Okay, well, the one isn't. This, the one is a uh, book written by a non-Roman Catholic. The two Babylons there. But the rest of these, these are all Roman Catholic. Okay, this is what I'm going to be using for this study. And I am a King James Bible-believing preacher, but I'm not going to be using this at all today. You see, I'm going to show you from the, if you want to look for an equivalent, this, this King James Bible came out in 1611. What was the equivalent for a Roman Catholic back in that time? It would have been the Dewey Reams version. Okay, right here I have it. All four volumes put out by the Roman Catholics. Okay, this was a, a Roman Catholic uh, professor, actually, that brought this out. This is an exact reprint, reproduction for Catholics. They have an edition for Protestants. This is the Catholic one. So I have that. I have a couple verse or a couple books here on the on the mass um, three different catechisms well I, yeah I guess you could call it three different catechisms I'll be showing this um, Council of Trent and the church teaches I have a lot of other books that are Catholic uh, I have studied the issue um, very much in depth I've read a lot of books from the Catholic Church so this is not some kind of a narrow-minded bigoted rant um, attacking you. Now, I will be using plain speech in this study. I do not believe in politically correct, um, nice little language that doesn't offend anybody. Okay, the truth is always going to offend people. So if you start to, you know, get offended because I'm using plain speech, well, watch another video. Don't start crying hate crime, all right? Uh, hate crime is what people say that do not believe in freedom. Uh, liberty of conscience. Okay, I'm a very strong proponent of liberty of conscience. I don't care how you want to worship, who you want to worship, whatever, whatever, you know, as long as you're not hurting anybody, as long as you're not threatening people's lives. And when you start, when people start to cry hate crime, that is a threat against my freedom and my ability to speak freely. Uh, people that are living in a free society can speak their minds. Okay, they're not afraid to talk about subjects that are controversial. When you start to have people monitoring speech, you are now a slave. All right, so don't start throwing around hate speech. All right, so I'm going to give you the 13 reasons here, and then I'm going to show you from Catholic sources. I'm going to back up that this is what they teach, and I'm going to show you, not from the King James Bible, but rather from the Dewey Reams, I'm going to show you that the practices, the teachings up here, the traditions of men, do not line up with even this. And let me say this about the Dewey Reams. This is based on a minority of the Greek manuscripts out there. Less than 1% of all extant Greek manuscripts line up over here. That's very important to understand. This is an Egyptian type of Bible. The King James Version, the Geneva, the Bishops, the Coverdale, a lot of those Bibles that came out in the uh, 16th century this one came out in the early 17th century, 1611 to be precise, as I said earlier. This is a Syrian type of Bible, and over 99% of all Greek manuscripts will line up here. Okay, and it's, it's I believe it's now over 5,000. So uh, there's quite a few manuscripts that support the King James, very few that support this Dewey Reams here. So this is actually a corrupted Bible. It's not even a real strong Bible, not based on real strong manuscripts. But I'm going to show you that even this one contradicts the teachings of the Catechism. Okay, first of all, the first reason why as a Christian you must reject the Mass, mass is because the Bible condemns cannibalism. Number two, if Jesus offered the first Mass at the Last Supper, then his death on the cross would have been unnecessary. Number three, the Vatican now prays to Lucifer as part of the Mass. We're going to be talking about that in this video. I'm going to show you some of that. Uh, number four, Hebrews chapter 10 disproves the need for a continuous sacrifice to pay for sins. Number five, the early Christians in the New Testament did not believe in the Eucharist or this Mass thing. They did not believe in it. Number six, Jesus Christ said it is finished on the cross and not at the Last Supper. 
Number seven, the dying thief was saved without ever partaking of bread and wine. The dying thief never had the mass. He never had that ceremony performed. Number eight, no one in the book of Acts was saved by drinking wine or eating bread. Number nine, none of the disciples partook of the literal flesh and blood of Jesus when he was physically present on the earth. Now, if you're not aware of what Catholicism teaches, Catholicism teaches that the bread and wine actually are the physical, when the priest does his you know, consecration thing, they become the physical flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. Now, when the physical flesh and blood was here, he's right there. Why didn't you eat him? We're going to talk about that in this study. Number 10, if the priest is supposed to be another Christ, then why does he have to offer Christ on the altar? Something else to think about. Number 11, do you lose your salvation when Christ dissolves in your stomach? Number 12, why does the mass ceremony mirror the ancient pagan Egyptian system practiced by Baal worshippers? I'm going to show you the proof on that. Number 13, does the mass give assurance of salvation? Because that's really what it's all about. Our job as people on this planet is to get to know our Creator, God the Father, and to know, do we have, are we right before Him? Do we have assurance of being saved? All right, that's the most important question that you have to ask yourself. And so this video is dedicated to those of you who are Catholics out there, who, or who, to Christians that know relatives or friends or whatever that are Catholics, and you might not understand the real teachings of the Catholic Church on this issue of the Mass and the Eucharistic celebration, the, the sacrament of the Eucharist and transubstantiation, the whole thing that happens. We're going to cover that today in great detail. So point number one, why you must reject the Mass. Well, Genesis chapter 9, verses 3 and 4. I'm going to show you here. I have to find the correct volume. That's volume number three. Here we have volume number one. I'm going to be showing you here from the Dewey Reams. Not going to be referencing this website says this and that website says that. We're not going to talk much about the internet in this study. I'm going to show you from the actual sources. Okay, now let me zoom my overhead camera in here a little bit. Okay, here we have the book of Genesis, chapter 9 and verse 3. Um, and all that moveth and liveth shall be yours for meat, even as the green herbs have I, have I delivered all to you, saving that flesh with blood you shall not eat. We say, well, that's way back there in the Old Testament. Come on now, you know, that's, that's way back there in the Old Testament. Well, and by the way, if you, if you doubt, you say, well, I don't agree with the 1610 Dewey Reams. The modern New American Bible, you can see it here online. I want to put the picture up. It says, any living creature that moves about shall be yours to eat. I, have, I give them all to you as I did the green plants. Only meat with its lifeblood still in it. You shall not eat. So even the newest official Catholic Bible, the New American Bible, agrees with the Dewey Reams there. You're not to eat blood. Okay, let's go to the next one. There are three references, three prohibitions, and very interesting how they're laid out throughout the Bible. I'll talk about that in a minute. Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17, I'll show you here. Leviticus... Chapter 17, verse 10 through 14. Okay, again we have Leviticus, chapter 17, verse 10. Any man whosoever of the house of Israel and of the strangers that sojourn among them, if he eat blood, I will set my face against his life and will destroy it out of his people. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you, that upon the, the next page here, altar you may make 
expiation with it for your souls, and the blood may be for an expiation of the soul. Therefore have I said to the children of Israel, No soul of you shall eat blood, nor of the strangers that sojourn with you. Any man whosoever of the children of Israel and of the strangers that sojourn with you, if by hunting or fowling he take wild beast or fowl, which it is lawful to eat, let him pour out the blood thereof and cover it with earth. For the life of all flesh is in the blood. Whereupon I said to the children of Israel, The blood of no flesh shall you eat, because the life of the flesh is in the blood, and whosoever eateth it shall die. So what did we have? The first reference was Genesis chapter 9. Now if you know the Bible, that was before the giving of the law. When Moses showed up and the Ten Commandments and, and all the Levitical law came in and everything else. That was before that. Genesis chapter 9. Here you have under the law. So you have before the law, you have under the law, and we're going to see in a minute after the law in the New Testament. The same prohibition against eating blood. How's that work out if you're believing in the Mass? Hmm. And just in case you say, well, what does the New American Bible say? Well, I'll put up the page here. It says, As for anyone, whether of the house of Israel or of the aliens residing among them, who consumes any blood, I will set myself against that individual and will cut that person off from among the people. Since the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement on the altar for yourselves, because it is the blood as life that makes atonement. That is why I have told the Israelites, No one among you, not even a resident alien, may consume blood. Anyone hunting, whether of the Israelites or of the aliens residing among them, who catches an animal or a bird that may be eaten, shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth. Since the life of all flesh is, is its blood, I have told the Israelites, You shall not consume the blood of any flesh. Since the life of all flesh is its blood, anyone who consumes it shall be cut off. You say, but wait a second. You said about the blood on the altar there. Yeah, well, think about what was going on there in the Old Testament under the Levitical system. They were sacrificing animals. Okay? So that's what's going on there. They're not making an early reference to the Mass and the sacrifice of the Mass. No, no. That's not what's going on there. They are prohibited from drinking blood and flesh. Now, last of all, we're going to see here in the New Testament... Not to switch volumes here. This is just volume one of the Old Testament. Let me get this one. Here we have. And I'll just show you this on camera here real quick. Need to zoom out a little bit. The original and true Reims New Testament of 1582. So this thing came out quite a bit before the King James Version. And uh, just show you here. Some of the pages of what it would have actually looked like originally. And this is put out by Dr. William G. Von Peters. Okay, and you can check out his information. He is definitely a Roman Catholic. All right, but let's look here in the book of Acts. Chapter 14, verse 20. Here you have the Acts of the Apostles. Sorry, these things are kind of big to move around. Um... Let me zoom in a little bit. It says here, But to write unto them that they refrain themselves from the contamination of idols and fornication and strangled things and blood. Not supposed to drink blood. And the New American Bible, of uh, the newer one here, it says, But tell them by letter to avoid pollution from idols, unlawful marriage, the meat of strangled animals and blood. So three different places in the 1610 Dewey Reams and also the New American Bible, the most recent one, three different places, before the law, under the law, after the law, all prohibit the drinking of blood. The eating of flesh and drinking of, with, the, with the blood in it. In other words, you can eat meat, but you're supposed to get that blood out of it. Cook it. Okay? You don't eat blood. Now, how does that work with the Mass? You say, well, you know, does Catholicism really teach that the elements are literal flesh and blood? Well, I'm going to show you about that. Let me move some of this stuff around here a little bit. First, we have a child's guide to the Mass. Let me show you this 
here on the camera. A child's guide to the mass for little children. We're going to work our way up. We'll start out here with what's written for little children and we'll just kind of go forward until we get up to the adults. Let's see if I can find this page. It doesn't have page numbers in it, so... Okay. Here we go. Here you have the priest. Let's zoom in. Father Mike begins to say the Eucharistic prayer. He speaks the words Jesus said to his friends, Take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body given up for you. Then Father Mike takes the cup of wine and says, This Take this, all of you, and drink. This is the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. Do this in, remember, in memory of me. Now the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, even though they still look the same. This is called consecration, the consecration. Jesus is with us. According to Catholic teaching, Jesus is with us. Close your eyes and think about Jesus. Hmm. So there you have that. And you say, well, that's just a little children's book. You know, why would you use a little children's book? Well, okay, let's go up to the next level. We have the New St. Joseph First Communion Catechism. Okay? And just to show you here, here you have all of the official recognition of the Roman Catholic Church. Nothing objectionable there. Two different ones, you know, Cardinal Spellman, you know, very interesting there. I think he was one of the ones that got uh, busted for molesting all these different children. You know, not too good there to have. But uh, we're going to go to number 51 here. Let me show you number 51 in this catechism. Zoom out here a little bit. Okay, it says, do you see Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist? No, I do not see Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist because he is hidden under the appearances of bread and wine. The Eucharist is Christ. He is really there. We cannot see him. We cannot hear him, but he is there. The host looks like bread, but it is really, uh, it is really the body of Jesus. The big host is for the priest. The small hosts are for the people. Each host is Jesus. The chalice contains the blood. It looks and tastes like wine, but it is really the blood of Jesus. The Mass is an act of love. Our Lord says to his Father, I love you. He tells this to his Father for us. He wants us to say it with him. So there you have the First Communion Catechism, saying that, it, yes, it is uh, blood they're saying there. Next, we have the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism. And again, I'll just show this at the beginning, so you, in case you're doubting. There you have this. All the official recognition by the Catholic hierarchy there. Okay, Catholic Book Publishing Company. So, what do we have here? Uh, number 347. So we'll go to number 347. Excuse me while I turn while I turn to this here. Okay, it says here, what happened when our Lord said, This is my body, this is my blood? When our Lord said, This is my body, the entire substance of the bread was changed into his body, and when he said, This is my blood, the entire substance of the wine was changed into his blood. Okay, you got it? It's not just symbolic. All right, it is taught to be literal. Next, we have the official one here, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. All right, this one here. Uh, see where it says it, I think. I think, I think that they have the... Okay, now I guess it's just in this fine print. But um, I mean, you can see there, oh, the imprimi potest thing there. 
Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger. Thought that was interesting. The former Pope Benedict. Thought that was unique. But we're going to go to number 1410 to 1411. Okay. Here we have 1410 to 1411. Let me zoom in here a little bit more so you can read it really well. 1410, it is Christ himself, the eternal high priest of the new covenant, who acting through the ministry of the priests offers the Eucharistic sacrifice, and it is the same Christ really present under the species of bread and wine, who is the offering of the Eucharistic sacrifice. Only validly ordained priests can preside at the Eucharist and consecrate the bread and the wine so that they become the body and blood of the Lord. It's right there. They are saying that that wafer and the wine become flesh and blood of Jesus. But how does that work when your own Bible, the Dewey Reams, the New American Bible, they both condemn eating flesh with the blood in it. How does that work? Interesting. Let's so look over here at the next page. We have 1413 and 1414. It says, by the consecration, the transubstantiation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ is brought about. Under the consecrated species of bread and wine, Christ himself, living and glorious, is present in a true, real, and substantial manner. His body and his blood with his soul and his divinity. Talking about the Council of Trent there, they affirm this stuff. As sacrifice, the Eucharist is also offered in reparation for the sins of the living and the dead and to obtain spiritual or temporal benefits from God. So the heart of salvation for a Roman Catholic is this mass ceremony, the Eucharist, transubstantiation, this mystical act when a regular wafer and wine become the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, even though the Bible prohibits doing that. Hmm. You say, well, what about the Bible? What about in John chapter 6? We're getting there. We'll get there. Don't get ahead of me. All right. So we have the official catechism there. Next, we're going to look at the uh, this book here. We have the Church Teaches, Documents of the Church in English Translation by Jesuit Fathers of St. Mary's College. Okay, we're going to go to number 712. Uh, let's see here. More towards the back, I guess. Again, I'm going to show you that this is the teachings of Catholicism. Okay, number 712. I, Berengarius, believe in interiorly and profess publicly that the bread and wine which are placed on the altar through the mystery of the sacred prayer and the words of our Redeemer, Redeemer are substantially changed into the true, proper, and life-giving flesh and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, these are different confessions here. The Sixth Council of Rome in 1079. Then you go down here. The profession of faith prescribed for Durandus of Oscar and followers 1208. He says here, we with a sincere heart firmly and unhesitatingly believe and loyally affirm that the sacrifice that is the bread and the wine variant that in the sacrament of the Eucharist, those things which before the consecration were bread and wine are the true body and the true blood of our Lord Jesus Christ after the consecration. In other words, when the consecration happens there, transubstantiation is the mystical thing that happens and then it becomes actual flesh and blood. But how does that work when the Bible, your Catholic Bible, condemns eating flesh with the blood in it? How does that work? You say, but what about John chapter 6? What about John chapter 6? Because that's where, that's where it disproves the whole thing. We're going to see about that. Let's go here in the Dewey Reams to John chapter 6. We're going to see about the words of what Jesus spoke here. We're going to see what he was talking about. John chapter 6. And by the way, if you're watching this and, and you're a saved Christian, you can follow along in your King James Bible just to see how bad this Dewey Reams is. Um, 
here we have the Gospel of St. John. We are in chapter 6 here, and we're going to go to uh, verse 53. Okay, I'm going to have to zoom out just a little bit. Jesus therefore said to them, Amen, uh, Amen. I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life everlasting, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me, and I in him. Okay? Now, the big thing there is people will say, well, see, right there, Jesus Christ is saying, he is talking about the Eucharist, how that this whole, you know, the the, the bread and the wine become the, the flesh, you know, and the blood. So, right there. Now, how can you refute that? Well, let me ask you a question. Did he, you know, as he's standing there and he says about how that, you know, it's his flesh and his blood um, did anybody come up and take a bite out of him? I mean, his literal flesh was right there. I mean, what would be the point of putting it into bread and wine? If it's his actual flesh and blood, which all the catechisms say that, it's not just, you know, well, it's, you know, symbolically, it's, you know, ah, they're saying it's actual flesh and blood. So why not go up and bite him while he's standing there? But let's just, I want to show you from this passage that totally debunks this whole thing. Let's continue reading verse 57. Now look at this. As the living Father hath sent me, and live by the Father, and he that eateth me the same also shall live by me. Now the King James rendering here is much better. It says, I live by the Father, but you know, let's just stick with this Dewey Reams. Notice it says there, as the living Father hath sent me, Jesus has been sent by the Father, and live by the Father. Jesus is living by the Father. He that eateth me the same shall also, also shall live by me. So he's saying, Jesus is saying, as I live by the Father, you are going to have to live by me. So the question comes up, was Jesus eating God the Father? No. What's Jesus speaking about here then? See, he is saying, I live this way by the Father, Therefore, you're going to have to live that way with me. So what is this way that Jesus is talking about? What is this, this thing that he's talking about? Jump down to verse 63 here. And here's the key to the whole passage. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I have spoken to you be spirit and life. How are you saved? How do you gain salvation? Through flesh or through spirit? Spirit. The written words of Scripture. Okay? That's what it's all about. The, fl the flesh profiteth nothing. You can eat the mass till you're blue in the face. You can go every single day of your life and it won't save you. I'm going to show you that as we continue in this study from the Dewey Reams. Okay? Second objection I have to the Mass. If Jesus offered the first Mass at the Last Supper, then His death on the cross would have been unnecessary. Think about that one. Let's go to the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism. I'm going to go to number 344. Okay, it says here, when did Christ institute the Holy Eucharist? Christ instituted the Holy Eucharist at the Last Supper the night before he died. Okay, and it goes on to read there. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but it talks about it was the Last Supper. Okay, when all the, you know, disciples, the apostles there, when they were present. That's when Jesus supposedly instituted the Last Supper. Okay. So let's go here in the Dewey Reams to Colossians chapter 2. I'll 
show you why this does not work. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. Okay, you see here it says Colossians chapter 2 and verse 13. And you, when you were dead in the offenses and the prep, prepuce of your flesh, did he quicken together with him, pardoning, pardoning you all offenses, wiping out the handwriting of decree that was against us, which was contrary to us. And the same he hath taken out of the way, fastening it to the cross. Um. So then you mean uh, salvation came not with the Eucharist, but with the cross? Uh-huh. What are you doing carrying out this mass thing and saying that that's salvation? It's not salvation. Adoy Reims even says so, right there. Salvation comes, your sins are taken away at the cross. Okay? Not re-sacrificing Jesus on an altar and eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which is prohibited in the Bible. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 15? You want a good definition of what the uh, gospel is? We'll read about this. 1 Corinthians... There's so many study notes in this Dewey Reams. They have to explain away the text, you know. And that's exactly what they do, by the way. I'm not just being mean or whatever else. They have to explain away the text over and over and over again. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. And I do you to understand, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in the which also you stand. By the which also you are saved. You are saved? Hmm. After what manner I preached unto you, if you keep it, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And then it goes on to talk about how He was seen there of the brethren. Where was it mentioned about the Mass? I didn't happen to see that in there. I didn't see Eucharist or transubstantiation or anybody really partaking of bread and wine. Why? He died for your sins. And by the way, it says there that, you, that uh, by, which, by the which also you are saved. The Mass is a repetitious, you have to continually do it. This is saying you are saved by what Jesus did on the cross. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. How about Romans chapter 10? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. See if we can find the Mass here. There you have, we're in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. For if thou confess with thy mouth our Lord Jesus, and in thy heart believe that God hath raised him up from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart we believe unto justice, but with the mouth confession is made to salvation. Um... Where did it say anything about bread and wine? It doesn't. You mean to tell me that uh, Roman Catholic tradition would contradict their own scriptures? Uh-huh. Just in a few places, mind you. A few thousand. <laughs> but now my third point here. The Vatican now prays to Lucifer as part of the Mass. Hmm. This is kind of interesting. And again, you know, you say, what's this have to do with it? Well, you need to realize that uh, your church is uh, now openly praying to Lucifer, to Satan. That's another one of the names of Satan that's given in the Bible. And you say, that's just a Protestant reading. That's in the King James Bible. We're going to see about that as we continue here. But um, I want to play a little bit of a video from my sermon that talks about uh, can a Christian take the mark of the beast and still go to heaven? I want to play here the 2012 and the 2013 
Easter Masses where they are actually talking about Lucifer. They are singing to Lucifer. So watch this video. Okay, and you say, but Brian, I think it's so offensive that you would say that the Vatican is satanic. Really? Well, why don't we watch the uh, Easter Mass in 2012? Let's watch this. Here's the video of it. And you're going to see something very interesting. If you turn to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, in your King James Bible, you will notice that one of the names of Satan is Lucifer. He, was the, he appears as an angel of light, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Lucifer is invoked at the Easter Mass. Here it is. Watch this. Celestia, humanis divina, iunguntum. Oramus ergo te domine, ut cereus iste in honorem tui nominis consecratus, ad noctis uius caliginem destruendam, in deficiens perseveret, et in odorem suavitatis acceptus, supernis luminaribus misceatur, flamas eius, lucifer matutinus inveniat, Ille in quan Lucifer quinescito casum, Christus filius tuus, 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 qui regressus ab inferis, humano generis serenus illus, et ecum there you go. You say, well, Brian, that was just once. Okay, let's watch the Easter 2013 Mass. Supernis Lucifer matutinus inveniat. Ile in quam Lucifer quinescito casum. Christus filius tuus, qui regressus ab inferis, humano generis serenus iluxit. Et tecum vivit et regnat in secula seculorum. Hmm, two years in a row. Oh yeah. You say, well they they that was probably just a fluke. They you know they, they wouldn't do it again, would they? Uh, here is a video. We're gonna watch this um, of the 2014 Easter Mass. So check this out. Supernis luminaribus misheatur, flamas eius, lucifer matutinus inveniat eius, lucifer matutinus inveniat, ille in quam lucifer Quinescito caso, Christus filius tuus, qui regressus ab inferis, humano generis serenus iluxit, et 
tecum vivit et regnat in secula seculorum. Amen. Hmm. I apologize for the quality of that video. It wasn't all that great. Um, this Dabu 7 guy or whatever, uh, he you know, didn't have a real good high quality video there. But the point is, you saw them saying the same things. Three years of invoking Lucifer in the Mass. Hmm. Interesting. But next I want to show you this video of this, this guy. And, you know, if I was a Catholic, I would want to distance myself from this guy. This guy's nuts. He calls himself the third eagle of the uh, apocalypse and the co-prophet of the end times or something. He's not dealing with a full deck up here, you know. Elevator doesn't go the whole way to the top floor. You know, bats in the belfry. All the clowns aren't in the circus, you know. This guy's weird. I mean, I'm going to play parts of his video and, and just kind of pause it as we go through. So let's watch this video. Welcome to Revelation Unraveled. I'm your host, William Tapley also known as the Third Eagle of the Apocalypse and the Co-Prophet of these end times. Normally I don't respond to anti-Catholic hate videos on YouTube. Okay, let me just pause it there for a minute. He says anti-Catholic hate videos. You see, you see a little, the little politically correct thing there, you know? We need to burn the heretics that are disagreeing with us. You know, watch out for this hate crime stuff. It's ridiculous. But let's continue. Because they are a dime a dozen. However, one of my subscribers, Lori, sent me a link to one by Dabu7 called Pope Francis Worships Lucifer at Easter Mass. And I thought I should respond because it's an extremely popular video and it's all based on a lie. And that is because the author, Dabu7, does not understand the Latin language. He thinks Lucifer in Latin refers to the demon, whereas in fact it refers to Jesus Christ, who is the morning star. And his video should be titled, Catholics Worship Jesus Christ. However, that would be the truth, and I'm not sure how committed Dabu7 is to the truth. Okay, let me pause it there again for a minute. I'm just going to zip ahead here because he plays this Dabu7 guy's video. And it, what's with the weird collared background? And he goes to blue, and then he goes to, you know, all these other bright collars. Guys, very strange. But um, he said there that Lucifer just means morning star. Um, no, it does not. I'm going to show you that here in a, in a couple minutes. From the Dewey Reams. Okay. And now he goes and he says that he's going to play the correct translation. And, you know, what he does is, let me just show you here. Let me get to the clip. Okay. And right there you see, he says, Lucifer. And down there he puts morning star. Now that's just being dishonest. Okay, Lucifer is, it's, they're saying Lucifer. It does not mean morning star. But let me continue here. Whoa, hold on. Christos Filios Tus. Christ is your son. Wait a second. If this video is talking about Lucifer, also known as the bright morning star, and the morning star is Jesus Christ, why does it say Christ is your son? Uh, I didn't think Jesus Christ had children or a son named Christ. What's that all about? Christ is your son? Hmm. Now this has nothing to do with 
uh, Jesus Christ. They are singing about Lucifer. And you say, well, does Lucifer has a, does he have a son, you know, named Christ? Uh, yeah, it's what the Bible calls the Antichrist. Okay, I talked about that in my in my video, my sermon on the, about can a Christian take the mark of the beast and still be saved. So, I'm not going to play the rest of the video. The guy's a nut. But, you know, another point I want to make is, in this text, Isaiah chapter 14, which I'm going to find it here in the, the Dewey Reams, in that text, it actually says, um, you know, this this word there, and I don't, I don't, you know, go to Hebrew and Greek very often, but the fact of the matter is that the Hebrew there, the word star does not appear anywhere in the text, in any manuscript, okay? The, the word Hebrew, the Hebrew word for star is kokab. There's no word star in Isaiah chapter 14. So when some liar comes out and he says, well, it just means morning star. And a lot of these new versions have put morning star back there in Hebrews, or uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. You know, Isaiah 14, 12 is about Lucifer being kicked out of heaven. Satan. You say, well, that's just your uh, Protestant King James Bible that says that. Oh, we're going to see about that. Isaiah chapter 14. Here in the Dewey Reams, the official Dewey Reams translation. All right, I'll show you here. Here we have Isaiah 14. Go down here to verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven? Lucifer, which didst rise in the morning, art thou fallen to the earth? That didst wound nations. Kind of confusing reading there. But you see the little letter B? Let's look at the little footnote here. As Lucifer, the greatest devil. Hmm. Lucifer, the greatest devil? So you mean the uh, 1610 Dewey Reams identifies Lucifer as Satan? Uh-huh. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And any Catholic that comes out and says, oh, you know, no, they're, they're just referring to Jesus Christ, that Jesus is, the, is, is Lucifer and all this stuff like that, they are openly lying to you right in your face. And if your church is the one true church and, and all this other stuff, and I know that there are Catholics that are pre-Vatican too, and they, and they openly say that this modern Catholic system is satanic and all that, but you have to understand that, you know, this practice of the Mass... If you're relying on that for salvation, it's never been right. But especially if you are a modern Catholic, believing in your modern Catholic system, they are openly worshiping Satan right now. Is this something that Christ Church would do at their official Mass, the biggest Mass of the year, the Easter Mass? It's a problem, isn't it? But let's continue with our study. Point number four, why you have to reject the Mass. Because Hebrews chapter 10 disproves the need for a continuous sacrifice to pay for sins. You say, what's your proof? The Dewey Reams of 1610. Let me get to it here. Hebrews chapter 10, we're going to read verses 10 through 14. Okay, you see over here, Hebrews chapter 10, we'll go down here to verse 10. It says here, In the which will we are sanctified by the oblation of the body of Jesus Christ once, and every priest indeed is ready daily ministering and often Offering the same hosts, which can never take away sins. Huh. But this man, offering one host for sins forever, sitteth on the right hand of God, henceforth expecting until his enemies be put the footstool of his feet. For by one oblation hath he consummated forever them that are sanctified. Okay. So, right there in the Dewey Reams, and it, this thing's... This is a very corrupt version. The King James 
the Bible makes it a lot clearer there in that passage, but I'm going to stick to Catholic sources for this video. But right there, it talks, it totally debunks the whole thing of the Mass. It's saying by one offering, once. And you get the priests that are standing there offering the same sacrifice over and over and over again, and they can't take away sins. How does that work? How do you reconcile the Mass, the teaching of the Mass, with that portion of Scripture right there? One offering, one sacrifice to take away sins. That's what this whole thing is. And, you know, I'll have to ask you this question. You say, well, we do believe in one sacrifice and, you know, and, and everything. Okay, is it the cross or the Eucharist? Problem number five that I have with the, the Mass, the whole system of the Mass. The early Christians in the New Testament did not believe in this pagan system. Okay, Acts chapter 16, verse 30. You're going to see this thing all throughout the Bible. If you read the Bible, which I know is, is you know, they say it's somewhat encouraged in things, but not really. You know, among, I mean, I've, I've met some Catholics and they say that really they aren't encouraged to read the Bible on their own. It's kind of a, don't read the Bible on your own, you'll fall into heresy. In other words, you actually see that your own Bible does not teach Catholicism, does not teach this central core part of Catholicism, which is the Mass your own writings contradict over and over again. The Catechism says one thing, your Catholic Bible says another. But let's look at this. Acts chapter 16, verse 30. Here we have Acts 16 and verse 30. And calling for light, he went in and trembling fell down to Paul and Silas at their feet. Okay, that's verse 29. And bringing them forth, he said, Masters, what must I do that I may be saved? Okay. Falling down before the Apostle Paul, and he says, what must I do to be saved? Now, if Paul is a good Catholic, he's going to say, you need to come and you need to join the one true church, and you need to come in for confession and go through the Mass, receive the Mass, become a baptized, practicing Roman Catholic. That's what he would say. The Mass must be part of salvation to line up with the teachings of Roman Catholicism. But what does he say? Verse 31, And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. You say, well, that's Protestant nonsense. Protestant heresy! Dewey Reams, put out by the Catholic Church. What are you going to do with that? Not one word about the Mass. Hmm. Isn't that something? Very interesting. Let's look next at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll wade through all these comments, all this commentary. Okay. First Epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, chapter 11. We're going to go down to verses 24 and 25. And giving thanks, break and said, Take ye and eat. This is my body, which shall be delivered for you. This do ye for the commemoration of me. In like manner also the chalice, after he had supped, saying, This chalice is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you shall drink for the commemoration of me. Commemoration? Oh, that doesn't sound like salvation to me. Commemoration is something that you do in remembrance, as the King James Bible says. Remembrance. Hmm. It's not an actual sacrifice, in other words, then according to this. According to the Dewey Reams. It's in commemoration. Not as, this is your salvation. It's just to commemorate what Jesus did. And that's what Bible-believing Christians believe. If you want to hold a, a, what we would call communion, where you eat some bread and drink some, we use grape juice, I don't drink wine, but you, you do that to remember what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's a time of reflection where you say, okay, I remember what Jesus did. Are there some sins in my life that I need to get, uh, you know, repent of and things? Not for salvation, 
but just to stay in fellowship with the Lord. Okay, people have this, this funny notion that as a, a Bible-believing Christian can just live in abject sin and, and God doesn't really care and they just they can you know do whatever they feel like doing and they never lose their salvation. That's not what it's about. All right. You want to stay in fellowship with the Lord. And a true Bible-believing Christian, if they do live in abject sin, God will do bad things to them. Okay, they don't get away with it. God will um, chasten them. All right. That's very important to get. But let's look next at Ephesians chapter 2. 